Hey y'all and welcome back to another long-awaited tutorial. This video is packed full of modeling tips and techniques that will give you the skills to be able to recreate a movie scene like this one from Back to the Future 3. It's not an exact copy of the scene, but rather a caricature of the scene from the movie with just enough similarities so that anyone who has seen the movie should be able to put the two together. So let's not waste any more time and get started. To start with, I downloaded a 3D model of the DeLorean from Colts 3D. After opening it up using Windows 10 3D Builder, I started to make some changes in order to convert it to replicate the version seen at the end of Back to the Future 3. I'm using basic shapes to cut away parts of the model I don't want, like the wheels, and also use the program to scale the model so it's 1 to 87th scale, as well as hollow the model. With that done, I move over to Tinkercad to create some new parts for the car, like the railroad wheels, and some other details like the electronics that sit on the hood of the car. Tinkercad is perfect for basic modeling, and if you're willing to spend a bit of time learning the program, you can create some pretty amazing details using basic shapes and tools. Once happy, the model is loaded into the 3D printer slicing program, where it's orientated and has supports added for 3D printing. For printing, I'm using my favourite printer, the Bene 4 Mono 3D printer from Nova 3D. So far it's been a great reliable printer. After a couple of hours printing, the models are ready for washing and post curing. This part can sometimes be messy, so be sure to always wear gloves. To save on alcohol, I first dip the model in a small pot of isopropyl alcohol to remove the bulk of the uncured resin. After that initial wash, they are put in the larger container of alcohol and washed for roughly 10 minutes to get all the uncured resin off. The wash and cure machine makes this job really easy, however you can also simply keep dunking the parts in alcohol to clean them off manually. Once washed, I use the airbrush to dry them before giving them a post-cure. This step ensures the parts are completely cured and not still soft. Don't worry Marty, it's completely safe. I've installed NordVPN. It has amazing speed. NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there. It's easy to use and can be set up to connect automatically, so you don't even need to press any buttons. In the future, they have this thing called the internet. NordVPN is a virtual private network. That means you can surf the web anonymously, your location stays private, and your data is encrypted. In the future, Marty, what you do online is worth money to big companies. They're always trying to spy on you. NordVPN also has free threat protection, which guards you against web trackers, harmful websites, infected files, as well as malicious ads. With NordVPN, you've never been so protected online. It even comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can try it risk-free. It's easy to use. It just takes a click, open the map, Click on a location, and you'll be connected in seconds. It's a win-win, Marty. Make sure to use the promo code TOWN so you can get NordVPN on a two-year plan plus an extra month for free. Browse the internet knowing that you are being protected while at the same time gaining access to so much more that the internet has to offer. That's nordvpn.com slash TOWN. Now the model is just like a kit you might purchase. The support material is cut and trimmed away from the model, and any small unwanted imperfections can be sanded away. The wheels are assembled with 0.8mm piece of piano wire. A small drop of super glue is used to hold them in place. Just be sure to press the wheels on quickly, so the glue doesn't grab before the wheel is fully pressed onto the wire. The same applies for both sides. A quick test shows the spacing is just perfect. Because we did so much sanding, the resin parts will need a wash. Not only to remove the sanding dust, but also to remove any grease and oil from our fingers. Once dry, they are ready for paint. I've found for resin models, to me a surface primer works quite well. For this build, I was also sent a few items from Micromark to make painting miniatures a little easier. For example, this paint clip stand. It's basically a honeycomb structure and wow, it proved so very useful. It works with my SMS painting clips and is super convenient. 
I was also sent a portable airbrush which I used to paint the DeLorean. I did create a small cradle for it just to make it a bit more convenient when filling the paint cup. As you can see it works quite well. I did find it struggled at producing a fine gradient and tended to leave a fine speckled appearance towards the edges of the spray pattern, but if you're painting a complete model with full coverage, it's perfect. Plus I'm sure you could use an adapter to connect a higher end airbrush to get an even better result if you wanted. The rest of the details were hand painted various colours using mostly Vallejo acrylic paints. As for the windscreen, I tried glossy acrylic, however it didn't work at all, so I ended up peeling it off and redoing it with epoxy resin, but unfortunately I didn't have my camera rolling for that part. I also did a small amount of weathering using some grimy black oil paints diluted with thinners. Just a very subtle effect to help highlight the panel lines and other fine details. To add weight so that it will roll better, I add some liquid gravity. This stuff is great for adding weight into odd shapes and can be used to fill the smallest of spaces. To set it permanently, some super glue is drizzled over the top. These tiny strips of styrene ensure the wheels stay in place. Now for the train. It's not exactly the same as the one from Back to the Future, However, we can at least make a few small changes to make it somewhat resemble the train we want. Firstly, we need to remove the coupler and some of the front structural parts to make room for the cow catcher. This was one of the 3D printed details we made earlier, along with the wooden tyre holder and the tyres that it's holding. This particular train has coal in the tender, however we want to swap that out with wood. For the wood I'm using twigs collected from the backyard and chopped up. The whole tender doesn't need filling, just the top layer. So a piece of foam is cut to size to hold the top layer of wood cuttings. It's shaped to fit perfectly over the top of the coal load underneath. To hide the green, it's painted with a brown paint and glue mixture, and then the wood cuttings are sprinkled over the top. Once there's a good covering of wood, it's locked down with a misting of isopropyl alcohol, followed with diluted mixture of Mod Podge mat and water. The last change I'm making is the smokestack. The old one is removed, and the new one was 3D printed, painted, and then glued in place. Now we can start on building the base. Like most of my older dioramas, it's made using some 7mm plywood. This is quite a large model measuring 1.2 meters long by 40 centimeters wide. Again, there's nothing overly fancy with the construction, just the plywood, glue, and some nails. The main feature of the model is the bridge. I used Tinkercad to draw and create the 3D version of the bridge, and I used a couple of photos from the movie to help recreate the bridge. My initial plan was to build it using bits of strip wood, which is definitely achievable, However, I didn't have enough to be able to finish the project, so instead I pivoted to using acrylic that could be laser cut. I was then able to separate all the parts to create SVG files that could be loaded into the laser cutting program and cut. To cut the parts, I'm using the BMO laser cutter. It's a 30 watt laser cutter, which is on the weaker side, but for thicker acrylic, I was able to cut it by doing two passes. To fuse the acrylic together, I use Weld on 3. Just be sure to use in a well ventilated area, because it's got some strong fumes. Hot glue is also used as a bit of a backup for the structural support pieces that were also laser cut. Acrylic as it is doesn't resemble wood at all. So to add some texture I use coarse grit sandpaper and drag it over the parts to simulate wood grain. It's only a subtle effect, but does help give it a bit of an irregular appearance and rounds the edges slightly. The rest of the bridge structure is assembled and glued together. Gradually as the structure comes together, it will build up some rigidity and hold itself together quite well. Once fully assembled, it's ready for priming and painting. Rust-Oleum primer is more than okay for big structures like this. 
Just try to avoid spraying too heavy so that it doesn't create drips and completely fill in the grain texture we added earlier. For a layer of colour I used Rust-Oleum Khaki. This is just a base layer as we'll be adding more colour over the top. Some MIG Grime Streaking Brusher Oil is used as a weathering layer. This layer is gently brushed on allowing it to run down the trestle. The enamel thinners will soften the Rust-Oleum paint layer, so try to avoid dragging the brush across the surface too much to avoid smudging the initial layers of paint. A blending layer is the third step. Somewhat closely matching the khaki colour, it's only a thin layer so the previous layers will still be visible underneath. The final layer are highlights. A moderate dry brushing of cork brown highlights the edges, followed up with a very light dry brushing of deck tan. Now for the track. This is a piece of Code 70 Micro Engineering Flex Track. A section of rail is trimmed just long enough to span the bridge structure. The rail heads are filed to remove any burrs so the joiners will fit without catching on loose material. The ties are removed, leaving just the two lengths of rail. The position of each rail is accurately marked on the bridge so that a small drop of superglue can be applied in the correct spot. Now the rail can simply be lined up and pressed down into position. The same is done for the other side. You can use a HO scale track gauge to make sure the width of the rails are properly spaced. Now the rest of the diorama can be planned. There are literally hundreds of different ways you can build up the landform. I've decided to use a combination of foam, paper, tape, plaster bandage and sculpting plaster. The foam will give the initial height and I can cut it quite accurately, enabling me to ensure I get the tracks to line up. The score and snap technique works quite well with high density foam. This foam is quite soft and is probably closer to something like florist's foam. It also cuts really well using hot wire tools. To fix the foam down, I'm using polyurethane glue. This stuff will expand a little, which is great for this type of foam. It will give a very strong bond once cured. Hot glue also comes in very handy not only for fixing small sections of foam down, but also for gluing the styrene bridge support structure to the foam baseboard as well. Additional foam is used to help get the track to be at the perfect level. This foam also sands really well. For the large gaps I start by covering them with some tape. Any tape should be fine. It's just the initial layer on which more layers will be applied. Next is a layer of paper to further build up and create an undulating ground appearance. Hot glue will help hold it down. This layer is built up roughly to the final shape of the ground layer. Some more tape may be needed to help ensure the paper holds its shape. The third layer is where it starts to get a bit messy. Plaster bandage is laid across the entire surface. This layer creates a much more rigid layer for the sculptor modelling plaster that will follow. Because again this is just a lower layer, it will be getting covered, we don't need to be overly precise. Just try to ensure each piece overlaps another piece. It can be bunched up to fill in areas, however the next layer after this will take care of that. Once dry we have a nice hard shell to build upon. The final landforming layer is Sculptor Modeling Mix, similar to Sculptor Mold. This layer is built up to give the final shape we want. It's a thick plaster mixture infused with paper fibers to give it volume. It gets mixed with water to a thick consistency and applied anywhere you want to build up terrain. While applying it, I do my best to avoid getting it over the painted trestle. I also used some plaster rock castings and pressed them into the wet plaster mix to create a bit of variety across the surface of the terrain. It's important to make sure the rock castings are also pre-wet to ensure they bond properly with the sculpted modelling mix. Now it's just a matter of spreading the plaster as desired until you're happy with the final contouring. 
it can be quite fun doing this step because the landform really starts to take shape. I continue to smooth the plaster as it begins to set, that way I can add roads and paths that are nice and smooth. Rough terrain can always be added later if desired using dirt texturing. Plaster splashes are bound to get in unwanted areas, but with a stiff bristle brush and some water, they can be cleaned off quite easily. Just remember that the bridge is quite fragile. If parts do end up breaking off, they can easily be repaired with some super glue. Now for some rock painting. I start with a heavily diluted warm grey. This specific colour is called Splinter Camouflage Base. It's basically a wash and gets applied across the entire surface of each rock. The second layer of paint is much darker grey that is applied in much the same way, but because the rocks are already damp from the first coat, this layer tends to flow into the cracks of the rocks. The third and fourth layers are dry brushed. Firstly, Slim Deck Tan is heavily dry brushed across each rock, working in all directions to help highlight all the sharp edges. The last layer is White Grey. This layer is dry brushed following more of a top down direction to simulate sunlight hitting the surface of the rocks. Now all the remaining white areas are covered with a coat of brown paint. Basically any type of brown will work. It's just a base colour to hide the white just in case some areas show through after we do the dirt texturing. It too is heavy load diluted so that it will soak into the plaster. Try to avoid going over the rocks we just painted. A smaller brush may be necessary to get into the tight spots under the bridge and around the rocks. Once that's done and dry, I attach the rest of the track. A bead of wood glue spread out is enough to hold it down. When the ballast is added later, that will ensure the track is firmly locked in place. You just need to be careful pushing the two halves of track together because the bridge sections are only being held with super glue. However, if it does break free, they can easily be reattached with some more super glue, which I ended up having to do a couple of times. And as always, it needs a test run. Extra ties are added. These had to be sanded down a little to get them to fit under the rail joiners. In order to add dirt texture, I'm using some dried sifted dirt. This batch I actually found beside a dirt road. Even though it's quite light in colour, it will still dry to a much darker shade once glue is applied. So to counteract that, I add some beige grout to the dirt, roughly a 2 to 1 mix. After thoroughly mixing the dirt and grout, it's ready to be applied. But first I mask the track and the bridge. There's a lot of sloping areas on the diorama, so I first brush over some diluted Mod Podge. This will ensure the dirt sticks to the sloping areas and not just run down to the bottom of the hill. Next, it's just a matter of sifting the dirt over the entire surface of the diorama, making sure to get good even coverage so that none of the painted plaster will show through. I make sure to avoid applying any of the glue over the rocks. However, when it comes to sifting the dirt, I go straight over the top of everything, including the rocks. We can dust the dirt away from the rocks later. To remove dirt from unwanted areas, I'm using the portable airbrush with the airflow turned right down. Just enough force to blow away the dirt in the desired areas. This is perfect for removing dirt from fragile areas like the bridge. It's also great for removing dirt from the rocks as well. However, a soft brush will also work quite well. To fix all this dirt down permanently, I mist over isopropyl alcohol to pre-wet the area, followed immediately with some scenery glue, which is one part Mod Podge mixed with three parts water and a few drops of dish soap. Misting them at the same time works quite well and helps speeds up this step. After misting the glue over the rocks and bridge, I make sure to clean excess glue from their surfaces by soaking them more heavily with alcohol after the glue has been applied. Now to finish off the track. The excess can be trimmed. I like to use the Dremel for this so that it can easily cut the tyre as well 
on an angle so that it matches the edge of the diorama. The bridge tyres don't really match the rest of the track. So to fix that I painted the rest of the tyres to somewhat match the bridge colour. It's not perfect and doesn't really need to be, but at least it will be a little closer than it was. Plus it will get ballasted and weathered which will also help blend the two together. And don't forget to clean the tops of the rails. The ballast I'm using is Woodland Scenics Grey Blend. I tend to use this because it's easy to get and the colour is consistent. The ballast is spread down the track starting between the tyres. I noticed some ballast was just disappearing near the start of the bridge. Then I realised there was a hole deep into the abyss of the diorama, just sucking up all the ballast. A couple of bits of paper took care of that. To spread the ballast, a wide soft brush works well. I avoid dragging my finger over the track because it will tend to rub away the paint we applied earlier. A good brush works just as well. I'm doing my best to avoid having ballast sitting on the tops of the tyres. The edges of the track get the same treatment. Tapping the rails also helps bed down the ballast and removes the loose bits of ballast from the top of the tyres. Gluing is straightforward, misting with isopropyl alcohol, followed by a drizzling of scenery glue we used earlier. Before applying static grass and trees, I need to figure out where the man-made details will be going. Like the end of the track barrier, and other details like barrels, wood, tents and signs. All of these details were either purchased and 3D printed or made using Tinkercad and then also 3D printed. The sign however was printed on photo paper and excess paper was peeled away from the back. Tiny bits of scale strip wood that were leftovers from my treehouse diorama are used to create the backing for the sign. It's small details like this that really make the diorama interesting. At the bottom of the ravine there's a small river. Artificial depth is created by painting the centre of the river a dark grey while the edges gradually become lighter. It's amazing at how effective this is at creating depth in a scene that it's only about 1cm deep. Additional texture is also added using various grades of dirt. The dirt is spread liberally along the embankments of the river. Using various colours and adding larger stones and some twigs as well. Once happy with the coverage, excess is brushed away from the centre and glue applied to hold it all in place. It's applied just the same as the first dirt layer, alcohol followed with scenic glue. Now for one of my favourite details, static grass. I use a variety of grasses and mix them together to get a colour that best matches what I'm after. I want a drier type grass for this model, so I mix some extra beige colours to get what I wanted. Now it's time to mark out the positions of the details. A simple dot using a pen should be more than enough. To apply the grass, Mod Podge is used. I want a sparsely grassed area, so when applying the glue, I stipple it sparingly over the ground. Next the static grass applicator is turned on and it gets shaken about 3cm above the surface focusing on the areas of glue. Like magic it stands up creating a realistic grass effect. To remove excess static grass, a vacuum with a stocking over the end is used. The grass is sucked up and then collected and put back into the static grass hopper so that it can be used on other areas of the diorama. This process is repeated right across the diorama, making sure to avoid the spots where details will be placed and also leaving bare patches where roads and paths will lie. I only work in small areas at a time because the glue tends to dry quite fast as the dirt texture sucks up the moisture from the glue. Additional layers of texture are added with various ground foams. These add a thicker, weed-like appearance as well as throwing in splashes of colour so that the model doesn't look overly uniform in colour and texture. The foam tends to roll down the hillside, so a spritz of water first will help prevent it from rolling down, at least until it's ready for glue. Going with the theme, I'm using dull greens and yellows to give a more arid, dry feel. 
texture is gradually built up, leaving a much more natural looking landscape. As with dirt, excess is blown away from unwanted areas with a gentle breeze from the airbrush. Fixing this layer again is done by misting over some isopropyl alcohol along with some scenic glue. Also making sure to wash excess glue from the rock faces and trestle using a blast of alcohol from the spray bottle. Trees for this diorama are made using pre-painted hecky tree material. They can be straightened if needed, but as I wouldn't be needing too many trees on this model, I just picked out the straightest trees I could find in the box. I also used some hecky natural colored tree material as well and painted them a warm gray color. Attaching foliage is a simple matter of spraying the tree with some spray adhesive. This is promptly followed with a sprinkling of medium green ground foam. Leaf texture is also prepared. A second spraying of adhesive is applied and then this is followed with a sprinkling of the leaf texture material. Lastly, the model gets sprayed with some matte spray to remove the tackiness of the spray adhesive. Scenic glue will also work great for this step as well. Before you know it, you'll have a small forest ready to be planted. Planting trees is just a matter of poking a hole, adding a drop of glue, and then pressing the tree into position. This is repeated as many times as necessary until you get a good coverage across the diorama. I tend to focus on adding a line of trees along the rear edge of the diorama to hide the edge. That way it looks like the model extends beyond the tree line, giving an illusion of a bigger scene. Now all the small details can be placed. A drop of Mod Pod should be more than enough to hold them down in position. It's these details that make the scene really come to life. More of the dirt texture can be used to help blend the details in with the surrounded scenery. Having access to a laser cutter makes stencils quick and easy, although quite fiddly. The text written on the barrier was done this way. A little trick to prevent paint from bleeding under the tape is to apply a layer of clear matte spray first. This will help lock those small gaps under the tape with a clear layer that won't be visible once finished. Now a number of light passes using off-white is applied. The end result looks quite good, especially from a few feet away. Now for some water. The edges of the river are dammed with acrylic and hot glue. It needs to be completely watertight, so just make sure to lay a good continuous bead of hot glue. I'm using a two-part epoxy resin to create the water. The two parts are carefully measured and mixed for roughly five minutes. To get a murky brown color, I added some burnt umber and blue pigment to the resin. It's only a thin layer of resin, so I mix it to be quite dark. Now it's the moment of truth. The resin will find its own level, so I focus on pouring the resin down the center of the river. To remove bubbles, I use a soldering heat torch. Be sure to avoid holding the torch in one spot for too long so that you don't burn the resin. Now it's left to cure overnight. Removing the hot glue is really easy with isopropyl alcohol. I simply soak the glue and then slowly peel it away. Now the acrylic can also be removed as well. There will often be a bit of a lip along the edges. This is removed with a sharp hobby knife and it's easier to do this before the resin is fully set, after about 12 hours worked for me. My ripples technique is a combination of Mod Podge gloss and the airbrush. A liberal amount of gloss is applied to the surface of the river and then the airbrush is used to tease and manipulate the gloss, giving it a natural and very realistic ripple effect. One of the final details to add is road weathering. Some yellow ochre pastel is ground down and dusted over the sections of road that see a bit of traffic. 
This really gives a nice highlight and adds contrast between the bushy areas and the spots that people walk on. Similarly, a dark weathering powder is dusted over the ballast as well to create that sense of use, as if they used a train to deliver the wood for the bridge construction. And to finish off the model, I used some PVC foam board to create a black border. And we're done. This is such a cool looking scene and is bound to be an attention grabber for anyone who is familiar with the movies. It was heaps of fun to build and I can't wait to try building other popular scenes from movies in miniature. If you want to make sure you don't miss future videos, be sure to subscribe. Cheers and thanks for watching.